Good morning and welcome to the 23rd meeting of 2024 in session 6 of the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee. We have no apologies today. Our only agenda item in public this morning is a continuation of our pre-budget scrutiny 2025-2026 evidence. And I therefore refer members to papers 1 and 2 and welcome to the meeting Kokab Stewart, Minister for Equalities, and the Minister is accompanied by Nick Bland, Deputy Director of Mainstreaming and Inclusion, and Matt Elsby, Deputy Director of Fiscal Policy and Constitution. You're all very welcome and thank you for coming along this morning. I now invite the Minister to make an opening statement before we move on to questions from committee members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, convener. It is a pleasure to be back for the second time um, uh, since I took over as the Minister for Equalities. And being no stranger to this committee, given my previous role as convener, you will be uh, well aware that uh, during that uh, time uh, I had a personal commitment to ensuring that the budget delivers for the most marginalised in Scotland. I came to the ministerial role determined to ensure that we accelerate progress to embed equality and human rights into everything that we do. The budget process is an integral part of that. This year, I know that you are particularly interested in transparency in the budget process. The Scottish Government is committed to embedding equality and human rights considerations into budget decision-making processes and its three principles of accountability, participation and transparency. For example, we have improved the Scottish Government's publication, Your Scotland, Your Finances, which the Scottish Government publishes as a citizen's budget. Budget. This online publication has been reviewed to improve accessibility and is now produced four times a year alongside the draft Scottish budget. The final budget approved by Parliament and in year to reflect autumn and spring budget revisions. Through successive Open Government National Action Plans, we have worked with the Parliament, its committees and wider stakeholders to improve the understanding of our public finances and 23 supporting documents uh, were published for the 2024-25 Scottish Budget. The Open Budget Survey, published by the Scottish Human Rights Commission in July, highlighted that Scotland has made progress across all three areas of open budgeting at a time when many countries stalled or indeed slipped backwards. We are also progressing actions to deliver the recommendations made by the Equality and Human Rights Budget Advisory Group. Last month, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and I met the advisory group to discuss how we can achieve our shared ambitions. Regarding the Scottish budget process of 25-26, the Scottish Government continues to face the most challenging financial situation since de devolution. The UK budget is a step in the right direction, but still leaves us facing enormous cost pressures going forwards. We therefore must make difficult decisions to put Scotland's finances on a sustainable footing while putting money behind our priorities. Equality and human rights considerations are not separate from these priorities but underpins them all. The Scottish Government will ensure that the budget process complies with our legal and statutory duties but we must and will go further than that. Evidence is being gathered from across government to support the decision-making process. This includes through a recent ministerial workshop chaired by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and supported by me as Minister for Equalities on Equality, Fairer Scotland and Child Rights in this year's budgets. Improvements made this year have focused on better integration with the programme for government and the budget process itself to ensure that evidence actively shapes budget decisions when these are made. For example, the cross-ministerial workshop took place earlier in the budget process and had a clearer focus on the difficult decisions required to bring the budget into balance. 
these improvements are supported by new analytical capabilities, which build on previous feasibility studies to uh, provide evidence on the distribution of government spending on childcare, health, schools and transport across different households. The Equality and Fairer Budget Statement will set out major decisions taken as part of the budget, including the evidence to support these. This will include decisions to maintain, increase or decrease spending. And I'm using my role to demonstrate visible leadership, I exert influence and support my ministerial colleagues to deliver effectively. Changing culture to mainstream equality and human rights across government is a matter of urgency as well as a moral obligation. In the coming months, I am meeting one-to-one -one with my colleagues, uh, ministerial colleagues, to explore what actions can be taken within each portfolio to improve equality and human rights. This including emphasising their duties under the Public uh, Service Equality Duty and highlighting the excellent guidance from the AHRC. I hope this committee recognises the government's commitment to continued improvement in equality and human rights budgeting and the actions that, are taken, uh, that we are taking to achieve this. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Minister. I appreciate that opening statement. You, you touched a bit about on there in regards to your previous role as convener of this committee and the experience that you have in terms of scrutiny of, of budgets. I would just like to ask, in terms of mainstreaming and participation, how have you taken that into your now role as a minister? Um, thank you for that question. I did re reflect on that. Um, and I think that, uh, on balance, it is an absolute bonus that I had the previous role um, as part of this committee, because um, I can see uh, more clearer the lens with in which the uh, citizen sees it. And I understand the challenges that uh, whilst government uh, does its work and provides documents, um, the challenge for us is to make sure that just because those documents are available, we also have to challenge the accessibility to the average citizen to improve that transparency. Um, so that, that was one reflection. And the other one, of course, is that Equalities covers every single strand of uh, the different portfolios and the big fiscal levers and the big budgets do not lie within the equalities budget. So the big challenge for myself in my role is to make sure that I do work across portfolio um, and try to encourage, support and challenge uh, my colleagues uh, across their portfolios. Thank you, Minister. We'll now move on to questions from Maggie Chapman, please. Thanks very much, Convener, and good morning, uh, Minister. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I've got a, a couple of questions just around some of that bigger picture uh, stuff that, that you, you highlighted, um, you know, talking about the role, the embedding of equalities and human rights across uh, governmental decision making. We heard uh, last week and, and previously about some of the disconnect, perhaps, between um, how we understand the national outcomes, how we understand those relationships to national performance framework um, uh, uh, structures, and then we've got the sustainable development goals as well. Can you just say a little bit more about what work is underway to ensure that we do actually connect these, these different um, processes, tools and, fr and frameworks? And are, do, do we have the data, I, I suppose, is, is part of that question as well? Yeah, thank you for that. I suppose the, um, it's always uh, a challenge and we want to prevent siloing. I think that's what you're referring to um, in your question there is that, uh, and that is the, the eternal conundrum um, is to get that clarity and that connection and collaboration across portfolios. It is a challenge that is absolutely uh, no doubt uh, within uh, that. Um, I've not had a direct role in the setting of the national outcomes, so I just want to say that uh, right from the beginning. Um, they were laid in Parliament uh, before my appointment to this role, um, but obviously I have a keen interest in that. Um, I think that I could possibly bring in, um, uh, I think Nick could maybe come in on this one, just because it was before my time. That's the only reason. 
So I, I guess on the, <clears throat> the cross portfolio working, that, that is a continuing challenge. Um, I suppose I'd say the presence of myself and Matt here supporting the minister is a, an indication of the close working that happens between my team supporting the minister on mainstreaming and Matt leading the, the, um, the exchequer team working on the budget. So that's one example of the, the cross portfolio working that happens from my mainstreaming team with teams throughout um, uh, throughout the government. Similarly, was working with teams uh, on the strategy uh, for um, the programme for government. So a similar role of us bringing expertise and knowledge in equality and human rights and working with colleagues who are working in those other policy areas. Um, the, the, the national outcomes uh, similarly have, have sought to take that mainstreamed approach. They had the, the um, thematic gender review has looked specifically at the issue of gender in the renewed national outcomes. Uh, that, that review was published just last month and that has led to a number of in specific inclusions of references to gender equality in some of the extended definitions of, 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 of the MPF. Um, but I suppose also that not having a specific outcome on gender, but mainstreaming it across all of the, the MPF outcomes. Okay. Can, can I, can I j just elaborate a, a little bit? If we're talking about how, how we do see equalities, um, understanding across, across different government departments, but also different uh, strategies and, 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 and ways of working. Given that certain da data sets aren't incorporated into the national outcomes, so things like homelessness, things like fuel poverty, things that have fundamental human rights implications for when they go wrong, um, how, how is it that we can, what is it that you feel you need in order to have, to, to, to be able to, to, to meet those outcomes given given some of the absence of data integration, but also some of the, the, the sort of failure to connect, connect the dots. And, and if we're talking about transparency, understanding that, OK, we're making this decision over here. We know it's going to affect over there, but we don't tell anybody about that. So I'm, I'm just trying to understand your sense, Minister, of, of how, how we are actually using our, the, the data that we have, the data sets that we have, given the, the, the structures of national outcomes, MPF, SDGs and all of that. Okay, I'll split that between myself and uh, Nick as well. So I'll give you my view on it and what I'm trying to achieve and then the technical side of the data thing, I think Nick will do a double hander there. Uh, so that is part of sort of what I alluded to in my opening remarks um, was that that's the value that I can add uh, is uh, working very closely with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and uh, making sure that I have access uh, to Cabinet Secretaries who are making those decisions um, I have arranged one-to-one uh, -one bilaterals. I'm starting with transport this week, actually. Um, so that work is now well underway. Um, the difference between before, if you're looking for improvements, um, was that last year the Minister for Equalities just attended those meetings. This year what has happened is that my role has been enhanced. Um, I've been given a specific role at the table and I'm taking an active part in that. So the one-to-one -one bilaterals with each cabinet secretary that obviously makes those decisions based on uh, the data or uh, and connecting those and as the cabinet secretary put it my role is to be able to step back and see the wood for the trees and to make those connections um, and put them front and center in front of so for instance in transport when I have my one-to-one -one, there'll be no doubt that I will be able to draw on uh, equality impacts that are made in transport from the budget decisions but they may have a knock-on effect on time planning, for instance, or um, uh, the availability of healthcare or schools. So I, I can do that in my role, uh, is to provide those uh, connections and therefore urge uh, the Cabinet Secretaries uh, to consider those outcomes when they're making a decision in their portfolio. Uh, so want to see the knock-on effect, but also I can convene 
and pass information between them as well. With the best will in the world, you know, the government is a big machine and everyone's in their bits trying to do the best job they can and they don't always have that. That leads me to the cultural change that is required for all of us, actually, to not only see things from our own point of view, but to make those connections across the way. So I'm, I'm leading that. Um, I am pursuing it vigorously. Um, and I am reporting back to the Cabinet Secretary on how those bilaterals go. And, uh, what, and I will make recommendations on that. The other key bit that I'm providing is support uh, to the officials that support the cabinet secretaries so that actually we're working from within government so that our papers and our evidence gathering that that all aligns as well to 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 bring everyone uh, bring everything together to give a clearer picture but on the specific data yeah, yeah pick up on the data and evidence so i mean there's very much a, a cross government focus on on equality da data through the equality data improvement plan and, and the equality evidence strategy um, and I know that, that there's a, a review of that that they'll be publishing before the, the end of the year. And, and that has been very much a, a driver, in a sense, a mainstreaming from that analytic team. So that doesn't sit with me, but from that analytic team, working with um, uh, statisticians and analysts across government to work on precisely those data gaps. And that, and that data and evidence, be it qualitative data or um, survey data or statistics, um, is drawn on in all sorts of ways, so drawn on uh, into the measurement of the, the national indicators of the national performance framework, brought into uh, equality impact assessment. So there, uh, in a sense, that data and evidence is a foundation for a lot of the work of government. And as I say, there's this cross-government specific focus on equality data through that EDIP. Final question, if I can, just, just a very quick question. What's your view on the, on the potential inclusion and the ask for the inclusion of a specific gender inequality as part of one of the national outcomes to bring us in line with the Sustainable De Development Goals and the SDG 5 particularly and international best practice? Yeah, I'll try and, I mean, it's actually quite a complex question <laughs> with that, and there are many views on that as well. Um, I listened with interest to the evidence that was given to the committee, and it's a conundrum that I sort of wrestle with, having a history myself and an interest um, in mainstreaming in particular. And, uh, I mean, it's actively being considered, so I'm not, you know, um, but... Uh, one of the, the issues, I suppose, is about the mainstreaming. Um, and I'm also getting calls um, regarding disaggregation and intersectional data as well. And what I'm wrestling with, I suppose, at the moment is making sure that there is no dilution uh, for any particular group. Uh, because one of the calls that I get is that we're not a homogenised group and women are not a homogenised group either. Um, and bearing in mind that they are over 50% of the population as well, so it's not sort of technically a minority group either. However, we know that the impacts of you know, budgeting have an impact on women um, and then it sort of like exponentially impacts can do that negatively if you are also uh, considered disabled or uh, ethnic minority, for instance. Um, so, yeah, that, that's where I am at the moment. I'm considering all of those strands and sort of like weighing up, sort of like, does it have to be one or the other? Is there a way that we can bring it all in together whilst not having so much data that we don't know what to do with, but also having sometimes when we're gathering data, it could be so small when you look at the intersectionalities that it's not valid. So it's making sure we've got that quality assurance sort of across the piece as well. Thanks, Karen. I'll leave it there. Thank you. And now move on to questions from Pam Gosell, please. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Minister, and good morning, um, uh, officials. Uh, last week, witnesses stressed the importance of collecting intersectional uh, data. Minister, could you please expand on how the Scottish Government uses qualitative data uh, and data not collected directly by the Government in understanding intersectional uh, inequalities? For example, how does it use such data when it comes to inequalities related to gender and BAME status? 
you. Thank you for that question. Um, so policy areas are expected to uh, conduct an equality impact assessments during the policy cycle uh, to inform their decisions. That's uh, clear expectations. And uh, this should draw on available evidence, as you say, um, to show the impact on groups with protected characteristics and the effectiveness of any mitigation measures as well. So it's important that we track that bit too. Um, and we expect portfolios to develop evidence that they can take an account on uh, the impact of the budgets on groups with protected characteristics um, as well. Um, and then make that connection with the evidence, the scale of this impact and the impact of the proposed spend as well. So, as you say, it's a range of evidence, qualitative and quantitative as well, I would, I would say. That's where the participation and the, the lived experience comes into it too. And that's especially important with marginalised groups, for instance, the, uh, the BAME community. Uh, so, I suppose um, it can be translated uh, into policy in a variety of ways. Um, Officials are happy to receive uh, briefings from external organisations. I know myself that I meet with, you know, in gender, I meet with Claire, with, you know, with many, many, I'm not going to list them because there's always folk that I miss. Um, but organisations and individuals may participate in formal consultation exercises um, and published work. Uh, may feature that evidence review supporting policy development. Uh, the equality analysis team uh, is currently finalising an evidence review on the experiences of non-binary people, for instance, in Scotland. Um, and that was an action that was set out uh, in the non-binary action plan, uh, which is to be published uh, shortly. Uh, so similar uh, exercises are undertaken across the protected characteristics, including the, the, BAM, uh, the BAME community as well. Um, I hope that gives you some reassurance. Go back, please, convener. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister, for that response. Minister, we heard last week that, for example, housing, um, you, you know, when people are made homeless, uh, that a female may act different from a male. Sometimes females do have right, relatives and friends to go to, and they may not be sleeping rough um, like a male may be, and that was from witnesses. Um, I want to ask about the kind of cultural side of this, that what if that was a BAME female? I certainly know it would be a completely different. How do you consider the cultural aspect? Because they're not in the characteristics. So um, how do you consider that? And that probably would probably come from external agencies as well to feed in. So. Yeah, um, and you're right to highlight the work of the external agencies, um, and uh, they do a power of work. They provide that evidence to government. Um, they certainly, it certainly comes to me, um, and I, I cannot. Uh, 100% say that it goes to everyone else, but, uh, you know, the copy lists are, are fairly wide. But that's where my role um, as Equalities Minister in the role that the Cabinet Secretary has asked me to do, to work collaboratively to support uh, Cabinet Secretaries uh, in when they're making their decisions, uh, to make sure they are cognizant of exactly the scenario that you have brought up. Uh, so I said that I was meeting with the Transport uh, Portfolio this week. I will be having meetings with the Minister for Housing so that I can put those uh, issues front and centre as part of the discussions so that they can uh, uh, take cognizance of that when they are making their housing uh, budget decisions. And I would, uh, th this is sort of, uh, you know, it's a progressive way of working that we're doing, and that's where I think I'm add, adding value with the background that I come from and the, the awareness that I have and the information that I got and the skills I developed when I was on this committee. Um, but you're right to say that that kind of data set could be quite small, that it might not figure. Uh, so that's where the, the collaborative and supportive work and, and remember, I'm there to uh, support, but I'm also there to challenge. That, that is a key part of my role as equalities, because we know that there is further work that requires to be done. We're absolutely making progress, but, you know, culture is very difficult to capture unless there's a human being that's presenting that. And that is the role of a Minister for Equalities, I would argue, to do that. Thank you.
Thank you. We'll now move on to questions from Marie, please. Marie McNair. Uh, good morning, Minister and your officials. It's good to see you back at the committee. Um, the committee of I uh, learned that the quality data improvement plan is progressing in a positive direction. What blockers, if any, have been experienced and, and what, what are the emerging uh, priorities for going forward um, for the next stage in uh, the work plan? Um, yeah, so analysts across uh, the Scottish Government and the NRS are now progressing uh, with the equality data improvement actions um, uh, set until the end of 2025. Um, action leads provide, uh, provided an update on progress in September 2024. Um, and of the 45 actions in the strategy, um, I you know, I can sort of highlight to you that 14 are complete, uh, 23 are on course, uh, seven are delayed and one is not yet uh, started on that. Uh, so details of progress and causes uh, for delays are discussed with the EDIP project board on a quarterly basis. Um, and uh, an interim review of the equality evidence strategy and EDIP will be published by the end of 2024. Um, and this will set out the challenges faced, but these can be expected to cover points such as issues with collecting um, and analysing data, um, especially with regards to data sets that are too small, for instance, and that uh, delays due to indirect processes. For example, some surveys are currently being evaluated, so new data is delayed uh, because of that as well, as well as issues of resourcing and prioritisation, as you would expect. Thanks. And there's likely to be further delays, or you won't, won't know that at this stage? I'm, um, well, obviously we want to prevent delays as much as possible, but I, I can't give you a definitive answer to that. Um, where there are suitable course corrections, uh, which do not alter the intent of the original action and lessons learned for the second half of the equality evidence strategy, they will be highlighted. Um, so work is ongoing on that, but I'm, I'm broadly, um, I'm content with the, the direction of travel there. I okay, appreciate that. Um, have you had, had, sorry, have you fed into the development of the, the, the new national outcomes and what discussions have taken place there? Uh, no, because as I said earlier, um, that, that was sort of like before my time, um, but I can uh, bring in Nick again if, if you wish further information on, on that. It'd be good. Yeah, so I <coughs> I'll expand a bit on the answer I, I, I gave earlier. Um, so one of the National Advisory Council for Women and Girls recommendations, one of their original recommendations, was for a, a gendered review of the national performance framework. And as the uh, NPF team has been going through its statutory review process, it has undertaken this, this, this um, gender thematic review. And that has led to a number of um, decisions around the wording and the extended definitions within NPF outcomes. So we've now got a care outcome with a very explicit focus on uh, the gendered aspects of that and the, and the economic dimension, the economic value, sorry, of, of unpaid care, something that the NACWG, amongst others, has really pushed uh, us rightly on. Um, but also an expansion of the uh, quality and human rights outcome to have specific reference to the advancement of, of gender equality and tackling violence against women and girls. So. That's one specific example of a gender lens being applied into uh, MPF. But um, the MPF, one of the purposes of it is to advance equality. So the, 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 as, a, as a framework as a whole, very much its purpose is to drive uh, this government and every other government's focus on, on equality and human rights. And we, you know, we have that specific equality and human rights outcome to express that. Thank you. Thanks, Kavira. Thank you. We'll now move on to questions from Tess Wright, please. Um, thank you, convener. Um, Minister, you talk about visible leadership and urgency. My question is about uh, the reinstatement of targets. So would the reinstatement of targets within the uh, national performance framework support the use of the framework to identify budget priorities relating to tackling inequalities? Um, yeah, thank you for uh, that sort of like that visible uh, leadership that uh, I'm taking. If you just give me a wee second, I'll uh, 
There we go. Um, yeah, so you were referring to the, the NPF, um, so that review doesn't fall within my remit, um, but I look forward to the outcome of the Parliament's uh, inquiry and working with colleagues and stakeholders in uh, implementing the next iteration of the NPF from 2025. Um, I'd be happy to follow up with the committee in writing um, on specific points relating to my role in the framework um, as Minister for Equalities. Thank you. Um, so in, in terms of a follow-up, so I'm, I am interested in the Equalities and Human Rights Fund, um, which has awarded millions of pounds to organisations since 2021. And we're going through the budget process. So this is an opportunity for you to provide some leadership and it funds controversial, controversial organisations such as LGBT Youth Scotland, which has so far been allocated, I think it's close to around £900,000 in taxpayers' money. And this year, children in lead withdrew funding following reports that a convicted paedophile had contributed to one of its coming out guides. So my question, Minister, is how is the Scottish Government monitoring the funding it allocates to equalities organisations to ensure that it is a responsible funder and what is the threshold and what is your threshold for withdrawing um, funding? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I do note that sort of similar questions have been raised in the chamber. Um, so with regards to uh, sort of those kind of funding decisions. Um, we continue to fund uh, LGBTQI uh, organisations that provide a service to a community that actually um, is facing increased threats in this particular climate at the moment. So um, that is one. Uh, the way that the quality assurance and the monitoning process, uh, that is d uh, done by now, I always get confused, forgive me, it's either Inspire or Aspire. I think it's Inspire is the, the organisation. So they make sure that the money that, uh, that is allocated by the Scottish Government, um, they make those decisions to uh, scrutinise the governance and to make sure that uh, the money that we give is being used for the purposes that it was intended. So there are quite clear sort of like guidance there and I'm quite happy. I think I have answered uh, questions in the chamber on this on occasion, but should uh, Tess White wish further information on that, I can certainly provide you with that. Mr. Because yeah. it's so important. So it's always important to do stock checks and particularly when you're giving figures of just under a million pounds to actually for you to provide monitoring and leadership to say it's not just this organization that's that's monitoring it's like am i personally satisfied that the taxpayer is getting value for money and is that particular organization and i've given one example of almost you know just under a million pounds is that organization doing what you as minister want it to do um, I've noted your comments, thank you, and I can follow up with the guidance that um, the, uh, the independent sort of fund distributors, um, as I said, either Inspire or Aspire, I can never remember which one, um, but as I said, there are quite clear uh, monitoring and uh, sort of governance structures there that they use. Uh, we have all that written down and I can provide you with that evidence. Thank you, thank you, convener. Okay, thank you. We'll now move on to questions from Paul O'Kane, please. Thank you very much, um, convener, and good morning to the minister and to officials. Um, this morning, I just want to explore a wee bit further, I think, in terms of uh, the context of some of the evidence that we heard last week, uh, in terms of um, the Equality and Fairer Scotland statement. And in particular, I'm interested in some of the evidence that we heard from Oxfam uh, about... It, they suggested that decisions are perhaps made first, and then a national outcome is uh, is uh, assigned, essentially. And I think some of the comments in the back and forth I had last week with Oxfam were about actually trying to take more of an approach where the outcome is the, the central pillar and the spokes that come off that are then the work that's done uh, around all the other pieces that we know about. So perhaps just a reflection from the Minister on that, whether she would agree that it seems a bit back to front at the moment. 
Um, I, I can see I can see where that view comes from. Um, absolutely, I'm very sympathetic to that, and I would go back to the value that I'm adding um, is to make sure that there is coherence. Um, and having that sort of like holistic view, uh, which I think that also, um, you know, you also sort of uh, took evidence, I think, um, on the equality evidence strategy. And uh, I think that Dr. Alison Hosey um, from the SHRC said that, you know, the the reports that we publish do give uh, progress against the strategy. Uh, it gives it a quantifiable picture of progress. Um, and she did recognise that uh, the progress that we are making is going to take years to actually come to fruition and see that. Now, I would agree with you that, uh, you know, maybe that could be speeded up, but we want to make sure that we get it right as well. That is the challenge um, in doing that. Um, but the, she, you know, she did recognise that the commitments to regular transparent updates had been fulfilled so far and needed to continue. Um, and I can give you that assurance that we will uh, continue to do that. Um, the NPF vision is reflected in the four key, pr key priorities expressed in our current programme for government, um, and they are fully aligned with the national outcomes. Um, and these priorities are at the heart of everything that we do as an organisation. Following the conclusion of the review of the national outcomes, we will be taking forward policy work to further embed NPF implementation plan, as recommended by the Finance and uh, Public Administration committee in 2022 um, so yeah you know responses to the government's consultation hard calls for increased accountability mechanisms including clarifying roles and responsibilities better scrutiny and improved government transparency actions taken and progress towards outcomes and you know we continue to consider these very very carefully um, I would remind you that I've not had any direct sort of like uh, role in that um, so far, but my role with the more active role that I am now taking with colleagues is to actually prevent exactly what uh, Paul O'Kane, you know, what you're suggesting, Mr. O'Kane, is that we do need to consider equality impacts earlier absolutely so we're making progress do we have more to do absolutely we have more to do um do we have all the data i would say that you know we can never have enough of the data but it has to be quality data that is relevant and usable by my colleagues um to be able to stand back and to provide them with the tools the training um so that they can make different decisions or indeed they may make the same decisions but they will have an enhanced view of what those impacts are and therefore any mitigating decisions can then be assessed more thoroughly as well. Okay, I wonder if we can just touch on the budget setting process itself, because I think that's that, that's obviously um, very important and very relevant to our discussions this morning and indeed the evidence we took last week. I think we heard that the Equality and Fairer Scotland statement and the Your Scotland, Your Finances document are very useful in explaining processes, but I think there's a sense that that happens after the fact. So I think there was a sense last week that budgetary decisions are made and essentially then there's a, a set of companies a, a, a sent for kind of the scrutiny of the equalities within it. And I think there was a sense of frustration <clears throat> um, that, you know, there has to be an opportunity to understand and scrutinise decisions before they're made. So is that something the Minister recognises? And is it something she is, is willing to take on board in terms of the evidence we've heard and to act upon that? Absolutely. I would always be open. <coughs> and I've been um, watching uh, the evidence on that um, I can bring Matt in here, if that's all right, yeah, right. regarding the equality and fairer uh, Scotland budget statements. Yep. Very happy to. So I think um, so t there's, there's two particular safeguards to make sure that ministers take account of equality impacts during the budget setting process. The first of those is the role of accountable officers. 
because we have the public sector equality duty, we have to make sure that ministers have paid due regard to the impacts of, of their policy choices on people sharing different protected characteristics. And therefore, when advice goes to ministers, ministers need to be made aware of those impacts and, and offered potential mitigating action. That still means ministers can go ahead with that choice, and it still means that they can take a certain decision, but there needs to be a step in the process where accountable officers are making their minister aware of, of those, protect, uh, those particular issues. That is something we think about through the budget process. That is something we thought about in the fiscal statement uh, in September, and we made sure we built in steps into that process to make sure there was a, a particular moment where a minister took advice around those issues. That, though, I think we sort of see as kind of a minimum. That's our statutory duty, and that's, that's sort of pay, making sure that we obey the law and make sure that sort of ministers pay due regard to those issues. What we are looking to do through this budget process is improve upon that, because the criticism that we've heard of Moxham is something we've heard before and something that we do want to look to, 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 to build on. Um, we are thinking about ways we can do this. One of those is in making sure that sort of, as, as um, the minister referred to, through this ministerial workshop, we created an opportunity for, for cabinet secretaries to basically say, what do they think the equality challenges would be within their portfolios based on our current understanding of, of where the budget is sitting? That allowed the Cabinet Secretary to finance and the First Minister to take those sorts of things into account and take those issues into account in order, as we get late further into the budget process, so that they're aware of where those challenges will be and potentially take different decisions. Now, we're obviously five weeks away from the budget, so we don't know what those decisions will be, but we've deliberately tried to set up this process this year to build in a moment and some process to take into account those decisions earlier on. My hope is that this will then be reflected in the Equalities and Fair Bu uh, Scotland budgeting statement in that the idea is that this will be a much more analytical document and move us much more into a space where we are able to not just set out the overall strategy for reducing inequalities, but where specific budget decisions have affected uh, positively or negatively um, inequality outcomes. Okay. Um, given the conversation we've just had and reflecting on the budget, in five weeks' time, I mean, is the Minister satisfied that that process is improving in terms of the interaction that you're having with stakeholders, firstly? And secondly, there was criticism of um, the pre-budget pre fiscal update in September, which was described as adhering poorly to the principles of human rights budgeting. So uh, it would be useful, I think, for the committee to understand the Minister's role in terms of supporting uh, the process that I think uh, Matt just described and some of the work that's ongoing. Uh, in terms of how do we increase the detail that goes to stakeholders and uh, explanation of potential impacts of budgetary decisions? Um, I mean, there is a growing wealth of information published alongside the Scottish budget. Um, I mean, for instance, there are uh, 23 uh, supporting documents were published by the Scottish Government to give further information on the 2024-25 Scottish budget. Um, but obviously, I've said you know, I totally recognise that more needs to be done, um, including uh, reviewing the information that is published alongside the Scottish Budget. Um, we're giving careful consideration to how we can improve public participation, for instance, uh, within the Scottish Budget in the longer term. Um, and also, for example, you know, bearing in mind that I meet with stakeholders on a regular basis um, and uh, the previous chair of airbag professor Angela O'Hagan um, her the suggestion that she made I am actively exploring alternative proposals of moving to a two-stage process with one publication in the summer and a further one alongside the budget so this would require a more fundamental overhaul of the current system um, and would therefore require careful assessment of how effective and feasible that would be. So that's the longer term. So I suppose what I'm saying is at the moment, uh, coming into the process and coming into my role when I did, I'm trying to change cultures and attitudes and ways of working. Um, as, as So the impact now, well, yeah, we'll need to take some time to measure that impact. The works and the actions have started now. I'm expecting uh, more positive evidence um, for next year's round of budgeting and certainly in you know in the the following year in that three-year cycle that's when I think we'll see the biggest impact in the the change of the way that we do things so I, I hear 
that in terms of longer term pieces of work, but in terms of this year's budget, do you expect to, you know, have seen improvement in terms of the way that stakeholders feel about their engagement and in terms of the work that's done? And when you come back to this committee, I suppose, do you think we're going to be having a similar conversation or do you think that we're going to see marked improvement? Well, I hope so. Um, I mean, you know, we, we are uh, making, I, I do think that we are making progress um, in, in lots of areas. Um, and my role is to look at the bits where we're getting stuck um, and to make sure that, you know, again, it's about providing the tools and the, the support. Um, and I know that my officials um, are sort of like ready and waiting, you know, that we're, we're, they're experts in that area and we're ready to support not only ministers and cabinet secretaries, but also their supporting officials as well. So the, the documents and the evidence that is put before ministers and cabinet secretaries um, has the expectation of uh, equalities uh, embedded in it right from the beginning. Um, so it's not a report back to me as a bolt-on, which was, I think, when I was part of this committee, that was one of the things I always said. It shouldn't be a bolt-on. It should come right from the beginning. And um, I'm, I'm optimistic. I am optimistic about that um, and Mr O'Kane will know that I will be very thorough in uh, relentlessly pursuing <laughs> and looking for that evidence and holding you know uh, my colleagues to that challenge which I, I can assure you uh, they are well up for that as well you know they're, they're absolutely up for that. Okay. Thank you convener. Thank you. We now have another question from Pam Gossel please. Thank you convener. Uh, Minister when it comes specifically to data on gender could I ask how, decision, uh, how the decision came about to include gender as opposed to sex for data analysis? Uh, and could you outline how the terms sex and gender should be defined <coughs> and used when making policy and budgetary decisions? Um, yeah, can I um, ask Nick to come in on that specific? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm aware that the previous... Um, uh, Scottish Government National Statistician undertook a, a careful bit of work to look at precisely that issue and um, it, I issued advice which is guiding how um, existing data sets and also surveys apply that. So th there was a very careful review of that. It's a, an area of contention, as you would, as you would understand, um, and I think the, the decision that was taken was one that was very driven, much driven by the analytic requirements of the data and our, and our ability to uh, disaggregate between different protected characteristics. Okay, thank you. That concludes our formal business in public this morning. I want to, th apologies, I have an indication from another member who'd like to come in. Tess White, please. Thank you, convener. I do have just two supplementaries, if I may. Um, and one, it, one came, they both came up last week. So, um, so coming back to the pre-budget fiscal update, we had two stakeholders last week who gave us feedback. So we had Sarah Cowan from the Scottish Women's Budget Group. So she shared with the committee last week that we've seen emergency in budget changes for the past three years. And she said that that looks like it's not, not now an exception that has become the norm. And minister, we had Dr. Alison Hosey who said in relation to this process that there's, there are lots of questions. She said it's not a very satisfactory process and it's not transparent. So you've, you've said that it's, it's really important for you to understand um, and scrutinise and you're getting sort of, you want to get, uh, look at areas that, that are stuck. This is one area that's stuck. It, 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 so how, how would you see that you're going to uh, change the culture that it's become the norm, not uh, ad hoc? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I mean, obviously, our uh, approach to impact assessments is guided by meeting our statutory duties whilst ensuring that our approach is proportionate. Um, so noting that a full analysis will continue to be provided annually as part of the Scottish budget process. Um, so we remain committed to protecting the most vulnerable in society, and we have sought to minimise the impact on people as much as possible through identifying underspends, pausing or slowing 
activity. Um, and in the interest of transparency, the Scottish Government published the details of the Equality and Fairer Scotland impact assessments uh, provided by portfolios on the 3rd of October, um, which was less than a month after the, the statement. Um, we do aim to publish these assessments as quickly as possible following policy decisions. Um, for example, we'll often lay impact assessments alongside when regulations are laid and when legislation is amended. So that's two key stakeholders that have given feedback. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that with you. But then my final question, convener, and it was something that, that was explored last week about rural proofing. And I, you know, I was new to that definition of rural proofing, but it, 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 it really resonated with me. And uh, Dr. Housie raised this in the evidence last week, and she talked about the geographical and the gender inequalities we're seeing through the centralisation of healthcare services. Now, that, that has a huge impact. And here is something that if you are going to provide leadership, then actually looking at the healthcare portfolio, um, she said that rural proofing does not do a satisfactory job when policy starts from a central belt perspective and then the rural aspect is considered as opposed to thinking about that from the start. And we've seen that with the belated rural workforce strategy in the NHS. So, so I would ask you, Minister, if you could look at that. But my question is, bearing in mind this, this, this huge feedback that we've got and this drive to centralisation, we had two examples last week of the impact that it's having on uh, women's uh, contraception, long-lasting contraception, having to travel huge distances. Like we had one example from Forfa to Dundee. And then this increase in, that's happening in Scotland in abortion rates. So that's the, the unintended consequence of centralising certain services. So the question, Minister, is how will the Scottish Government and how will you ensure that rural proofing is being considered at the start of the budgeting and policy making process, not as it is now at the end. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, uh, I think that it's given me an opportunity to sort of reinforce my message that I made um, at the beginning of um, my contributions to this committee. Um, so those uh, sort of like, I suppose, in-depth details of each portfolio area and uh, the member highlights the health in particular. Um, I, I don't think that I would be expected as the Equalities Minister to have that level of detail. What I would be expected to do is to highlight, as you say, the inequality or equality impacts that can happen um, and draw those out by working uh, with my Cabinet Secretary and portfolio leads in those areas. So they are cognizance of that. And I would be doing that regarding rurality as I would be regarding uh, disabled people, reg you know, regarding all of these different issues. Um, I mean, you know, during the summer I had the chance to actually uh, visit different locations. So uh, housing was one. Um, and, you know, the fact that it will cost much, much more money to be building houses in certain areas across the country. Um, and, you know, it would be easier for transportation of materials, for instance, in the central belt than it would be. So it, it's looking at those budget decisions and making sure uh, that uh, accessibility and availability. So what my job is to support my colleagues so that they have uh, that lens that they're seeing it with. And I can assure you that I will be doing my absolute best to do that. And just you can assure me, and you said it's very difficult to measure culture, but if you believe, and as many do, that culture eats strategy for breakfast and planning for breakfast, if you've got a culture yeah. that centralises certain services, let's say, and I've given a very small example, but it's huge for a lot of women, that, that if you're going to provide leadership and change, that you can actually say there are certain outcomes that we need to measure and they're coming from the different committees, you could, let's say, go into this budget round and say, 
we're here, we're here from the health committee. This, this direction of travel is having a massively negative impact <coughs> on ethnic minorities and women, let's say, for example. So you could take and say, on these things, we want to show measurable change, measurable improvement. So that's what I'm saying and asking you, Minister, is that something that you can and will do to help start to make human rights budgeting and equalities really, really impact uh, the working and the, the, the lives of, of people in Scotland? Um, I take my role in mainstreaming equality across our portfolios extremely seriously, um, and the member will be aware of that. Um, and ultimately, um, I suppose I should be doing myself out of a job because every single portfolio and every minister that is making budget decisions, they should have the confidence, they should have the tools, they should have the data, they should have everything they need. In, or, well, yes, so this is a challenge that all countries across the world are grappling with, um, and <coughs> I am satisfied um, that uh, we are making progress um, in this area. And I can assure the member and the committee um, that I will continue uh, to provide the service and the support and the leadership in my role that mainstreaming and true embedding of mainstreaming requires. Thank you. Thank you, Camina. Thank you. Thank you all. Does any other members have any questions that they may wish to ask before I close? Okay, thank you. So that does draw us to a close on our public session. I want to thank the Minister and our officials for attending this morning and we will now move into private to discuss the final items on our agenda. Thank you. <laughs>